All right. Um, welcome back. Welcome back. I see uh, not everyone has made it back from the, from the main auditorium yet. For those who have, I hope you, uh, you enjoyed the, the discussion. Um, it, was, uh, it was certainly interesting. Um, and some of the things that we were talking about here today over the course since this morning came up as well. So this idea of uh, how can we make a city smart using information technology and then uh, not just making it smart, but giving it, giving it a sort of direction. So, so uh, a direction towards a circular economy. Um, and so during this last uh, session, we have uh, just under an hour. What we'd like to do is basically recap uh, a bit of the day. Uh, and I'll do that with a, with a panel who um, I'll welcome up in a minute. Uh, but what we'll also like to do is just talk a little bit more about which stakeholders are involved and how do you engage them and how do you collaborate with them. Uh, as with the previous sessions, uh, there is plenty of room to ask questions. So there's the mics on the side. Uh, there is, again, the app that you can use uh, and um, uh, post, uh, post your questions, which I'll get uh, on this uh, tablet. Um, but um, to start us off with, um, let's, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, well, all panel uh, members to, uh, to the stage. And they've all been, in one way or another, involved in, uh, in, in one of the panels before. Um, Ian Gullen, CEO of Zero Waste Scotland, Joel Corrado, technology strategist at Cisco, uh, Owen Zacharias uh, uh, from Delta Development, and the, well, the, the, although Anita hasn't been on stage yet, um, she is uh, ve very well informed and we've heard a lot about, uh, the, about Paris so far from Antoinette. Um, and so uh, Anita from the uh, Agency of the Urban uh, Environment, or in French, the Agence d'Ecologie Urbaine de la ville de Paris. That's probably as far as my French goes. Um, thank you, thank you for joining uh, joining us here on stage. Um, for well, as I said, maybe not everyone has so far seen all of the sessions today. So to get us kind of started, I'd be keen to maybe from all of you get a bit of a, a brief recap on um, what did you see in uh, see coming out of, of, of either your, your session or maybe a little bit broader of the day and. Um, Let's start with you, Ian. Okay. Uh, yeah, what happened in my session? Uh, I uh, talked a lot, or shouted a lot. Uh, <laughs> so that was my angle, was to really not just shout out about what we're doing in Scotland, but you know, to hopefully encourage everybody to shout out uh, about the circular economy, and particularly the collaborative nature of the circular economy, because I really do think uh, it is developing from strength to strength uh, and I'd like to think that what we're doing in Scotland demonstrates that that you know it has it has uh, taken hold this is not something that we're just talking about uh, in Scotland yes we have a, a strategy a government strategy it outlines the ambitions of the, the country uh, and a number of activities and actions to take forward but actually we're now seeing businesses individual businesses and, and collections of businesses particularly uh, in the Glasgow area who are really embracing this idea now and beginning to uh, yeah, form form collaborative partnerships around some of those opportunities. Uh, and obviously, I talked about uh, one of the one of the opportunities, which was a few people have mentioned to me all day, is the the one from uh, making beer from bread. <laughs> uh, I, I did. Somebody did point out. One of my colleagues from Glasgow did. I neglected to say there's another there's another part to that. that somebody's actually making bread from beer, uh, or rather, <laughs> but that's not as attractive. So that's a circular. Uh, so that's very yeah. circular. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think what I, myself, so my session was kind of uh, back to back with Francois Bonnet from ACR Plus. It was really about what support structures are in place at a kind of national, uh, from a Scottish perspective, and a regional level and a city level to support cities uh, and the like, uh, take forward strategies around the circular economy. And I think there's a, it's really about, again, collaboration. It's about sharing that. You know, no, one, no one's written. Uh, the kind of the rule book on how to turn a city into a circular city. We're all still learning. We're all at the start of this, uh, and that's where organisations like ACR Plus and my own organisation, Zero Waste Scotland, are keen to facilitate that sharing, and demonstrate what's going on, bring people together, uh, particularly business leaders. I think business leaders are really hearing about this now. They, they kind of get excited by the idea of a circular economy. Uh, as I said in my presentation, I think you know we've done a lot of things in the past as Zero Waste Scotland around recycling and resource efficiency, uh, but a lot of that is still what I call backdoor. Uh, it's, it's, it's positioned at the backdoor uh, in terms of 
uh, efficiency savings or being making sure the bins are the right and are put out on the right day. Uh, but the circular economy is, is really gaining traction at boardroom level. I think you know we've heard a lot about that today, and, and we, we're beginning to see that in Scotland that people are different sectors. We've also got some key sectors in Scotland, so that's been our focus. We haven't tried to, well, we, we haven't really focused on engaging with everybody. We've gone into the key sectors where we think, where, where their evidence suggests that there is there's real gains to be made. Uh, food and drink is obviously one of them. Oil and gas, uh, you know, the renewables, uh, as well as a manufacturing base. So I think that's that's, you know, for us, uh, you know, my, you know, I said in my, my presentation, it is happening. I think you know, we sometimes still get a sense that we're all still talking about the circular economy. There's a lot of theory and, and what it can do, and people are saying, well, yeah, it can it can do this, it can achieve that, it will demonstrate more jo sorry, it'll create more jobs. There's carbon savings, but we're now seeing it. We are now beginning to see it happen. Uh, I'm seeing it in Scotland, and I know by, you know, hearing more about what's happening in other parts of Europe uh, and beyond, even just being here today again, it's just an excitement. Uh, just as one take takeaway thing, is that? Do you want me to say well, that now as well? I, I, for my day? I think. I think. It, I mean, it wasn't something I said, and it's quite interesting. I don't know. If, I mean, maybe I missed it. Uh, for the day up till you know, probably. The first person we heard speak was somebody from the Commission, uh, and they talked about the EU package uh, that currently was launched last year, and, and there's, there's still kind of progress being made. I haven't heard anybody else mention it in any of the presentations. I didn't mention it, uh, and I didn't hear anybody else mention it. And I think that's, that's, that's quite intriguing to me, because while the package was being kind of brought to fruition last December, uh, in Europe, and it was a big thing. A lot of people were really concentrating on it, uh, and that is part of my job. You know, keeping an eye on Brussels and stuff like that. We were also, Zero Waste Scotland, talking to businesses on the ground in Glasgow uh, and wider Scotland, uh, and those businesses didn't know that there was a e EU circular economy package. And when you mentioned it to them, they kind of looked at you. What is that? What, what's that? Mm. You know, it, I'm not saying it doesn't need the package. I'm not saying the package isn't going to be helpful, but. The takeaway for me is this is happening with or without the package or whatever. Mm. And sometimes we get really, really obsessed by this package and what it can and cannot do and what's in it. And my feeling is that businesses, particularly the progressive businesses, both some of the large businesses that are represented to here today, uh, and particularly through the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, C100, but also some of the small players that we have in Scotland are just getting on with us. This, this does make business sense. We were just talking about that earlier. This is business. This is just... People are now really understanding that this makes sense. There's huge opportunities for them as individual businesses and key sectors. And, and you see that now with cities thinking, we need to tap into this. And I saw, it's just my takeaway about, yeah, well, what package? Mm. And um, that, that's an interesting, and, and maybe just a, a bit of a segue to um, uh, Anita, where is this, this idea of, of creating mm -hmm. like a, a bottom-up approach to uh, a circular economy, not necessarily waiting for a federal government or sorts. Um, it's a bit what, uh, what Antoinette uh, talked about as well, right? Yes, this morning Antoinette wanted to highlight that in Paris we, w we have issues, we know the issues we have on materials, on building materials and, and so on, but um, the mayor wanted to, to have solution from the, from the people of Paris, from the stakeholders of Paris, so she, we gathered uh, more than uh, 240 stakeholders uh, together last year and they make proposal in a general assembly so it was another way to to develop uh, economy circular for paris not not uh, just to have uh, some uh, vision when well, the uh, mayor of paris had a vision for the city she wants to make a resilient city she wants to make an inclusive city so that's an important uh, vision political vision for the city but also also to to work with with the the business with the NGO organization with the academia, all kind of um, of resources of the of the of Paris to make things possible. And and, and in that, uh, so Paris released uh, the white paper on, on the circular economy. Um, is there is there a, a role for IT uh, or the information technology laid in that out already or? Well, it wasn't the focus of the the white paper mm. and not now even now it's not the focus of of our work because uh, and as we said this morning it's more like um, uh, community neighborhood and and what and 
the need to work together. So I think IT techno uh, information technolo technology make this possible because we can uh, exchange yeah. uh, more more uh, efficiency. But I don't think it's uh, the most important of the of the issue. Which which kind of uh, Joel, which also came up in uh, in the session uh, in New York, right? Uh, totally. So um, we had a very various panelists talking about uh, examples in logistics, uh, in technology, and then we had the perspective of the Director of Innovation of the City of New York, which was focusing on modularity, was focusing on creating the frameworks that will enable the cities to deploy more rapidly in, more, in a more standard way, in a more open source way, these technologies to solve the issues that the cities have and provide new citizen services. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, what we took as, um, as a main idea of our panel was the ability that uh, companies like DHL that are looking into new circular economy models can be applicable to cities, can be applicable across other enterprises. The funny thing was how deployment of software, sustainability software in cities uh, for circular economy models are helping change hairdressers, small and medium businesses in cities make better business decisions. And uh, we also learned that DHL shouldn't charge all of their electric <laughs> vehicles at the same time, because if they did, then the city would be dark and everybody would be without any electricity. Uh, but it was a very interesting panel uh, group that uh, focused on the different challenges that uh, these different verticals have. And actually, by the questions that were made, how can these models uh, go from one vertical to the other in order to bring more added value? Yes. And um, sort of um, uh, bringing that to the design of, of, of a city, which, uh, Owen, you talked a little bit about, well, you haven't actually designed the whole city yet, but there's some plans with the valley. Um, give us a few uh, years. Give, uh, maybe a few years. I mean, where you've gotten to in, in just the last couple of years. Um, could you maybe share a bit on, on what happened in the design panel and what you guys spoke about? Yeah, absolutely. It was a really exciting discussion this morning, and we had a nice mix between sort of macro and micro applications. We had designers, <coughs> excuse me, focusing in on design related to human beings on sort of a micro, small startup and, and, and human scale. And then we moved all the way over to a city like, uh, like Petersboro, who is a city that has really been engaging in the circular economy on a systemic level with a lot of its businesses. Then we also had what Delta was doing in sort of the creation of the bricks and the hardware and the software and all of this in order to, to put the assets in place that could then link on to promoting and enabling circularity. Um, and I thought that for one of the takeaways that I really had and that I think is really exciting on where the circular economy is at right now in terms of its development was really that the, you saw that through this micro all the way through the macro and then the application, the common thread was really that the people are, need to be serviced. And I thought that that was a really fantastic development now that we were looking to how do we actually increase quality of life to human beings by in a way that also decouples growth from resource consumption. So we've always and now historically over the last five, three years with the circular economy have talked about de uh, decoupling growth from resource consumption and that addition over how do we improve quality of life for city, for city, for people in cities through decoupling growth from resource consumption, I thought is a huge addition and one that's very exciting to us because at the end of the day, cities without people are what? Right. So. Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> Chernobyl. <laughs> yeah. But so, so for us, and that was, I think, the main takeaway that I had. And what we ended up seeing was really the design, but then also that, that level of policy and the top-down approach combined with the bottom-up approach from the different communities. We talked about London and the different little boroughs of London, my city of Amsterdam, and the different initiatives taking place in the neighborhoods. And it, it came through almost a hybrid strategy approach where we looked at guidance coming from the top down, uh, inspiration and leadership coming from the top down in terms of policy, and then real activities and action coming a little bit more from bottom up from citizen members of the cities and actual companies and businesses operating in there. Um, I, thanks, and, and um, uh, I have a follow-up question on that, but just before that, I'd like to uh, encourage you all to, uh, to ask your questions, and if you haven't been in one of the previous sessions, uh, do feel free to, uh, to pose your question to, 
one of the, the panelists uh, or come up to the mic and, and wave your hand so, so we, see, uh, we see it. Uh, one of the interesting things that, that you mentioned in the design uh, panel session was about uh, self-learning houses and how you might uh, enable houses to be with, with IT to be well almost Watson-like self-learning. And I found that quite, quite striking. You maybe want to elude a bit on, on that? Yeah, that was, that's really neat. And we had a couple things. And so we've been working a lot with IBM at Delta about how do we incorporate Watson into our area developments that we're creating. We look at this primarily as how do we put a brain into our whole area developments. And these are how buildings are talking with each other, interacting with each other, interacting with the environment to gain data and, and analyze data um, in order to provide solutions to the, the residents and the users of the real property. And in that respect, we've really been looking a lot more at, at looking at wise buildings instead of smart technology or smart buildings. And think of it that having somebody that's smart knows every answer to give you, and somebody that's wise knows whether to give you that answer or not. <laughs> and that's a key distinction because being overloaded with a ton of data can actually even complicate your decision-making process. And so having wise systems tell me, okay, at this point I need to know A, B, C, and not D. So I don't tell you D, but I hold D off until when you need to know it coming down the pipeline. So that type of thing is quite exciting for us. We moved that from the offices even into the, into the homes, and I thought that that was such a fantastic uh, analogy, is that we were looking at the home as an, your own uh, economy. And so that was really the micro level, and we talked about macro systems. And, this, and one of the things that we touched on was the home is your own economy, where you could actually buy this system, and then you could download recipes, of course, for beer. <laughs> we talked about <laughs> beer, too. And you could download recipes for beer, and then you could actually, at home, brew brewery-quality beer in your kitchen. And so that was really how, the, through data and information, we could actually provide services and provide high-quality services and only an arm length away from, from the consumer. Well, it's, it's, in a way, the, uh, the ultimate local uh, resource feedback loops. And, uh, that's well, a real microbrew. That's really microbrew, yeah, exactly. Um, so making maybe a bit of the step to sort of engaging stakeholders. And Ian, you alluded to that already, and Anita as well. Um, just posing the question, how, how, what does uh, each of the players, um, what's their role? If we want to change the economy, I think we're, we're sort of quite aware that we need to work with all the players. From, from actually e all of your experiences in, in sort of working with this and clearly the collaboration element, um, share some thoughts about what, what's, what's each of their roles in, in, in making that transition. Um, anytime. Well. We, we, we like to gather the stakeholders with, uh, in working groups. Uh, maybe it's an uh, old way to, to work, not really <laughs> IT uh, way of working. But, but effective. But <laughs> it's effective because we have uh, in uh, specific topics, we, we ask for um, stakeholders that are architect, uh, for example, for in building construction, we ask with uh, urban planner, architects, or people from construction, and we, we want to to um, ask questions, what are the, wrong, the good questions to ask, and uh, what are, how can we develop good action, good solutions together, and we can also um, uh, choose for one leader to make the action concrete. So it's one way we like to do. We, during the General Assembly, we have uh, eight uh, working groups. We gather three times together to, to make pr proposals. And so we go on with this method on with the, our action plan, the 16 um, uh, action that uh, Antoinette uh, talked about this morning. So we go on with this method to decide how together we go, we're going to lead and make possible these concrete actions. And also we, ha we have uh, called projects for, for project leaders. We provide us uh, spaces for us. For for example, um, we in the um, we have a uh, call project, uh, which is called metabolism, urban metabolism, and we ask a project leader to provide solution for us for the administration. For example, uh, one um, project leader uh, took our bio waste to make um, energy with bio waste, and now this uh, this small uh, enterprise, which is called Love Your Waste, mm -hmm. is gone is uh, grows up. Um, 
thanks to our co project call and thanks to this exper experimentation for innovation. And also we provide, uh, we have another, um, another call project, Paris Culture, which is a, a call project for urban agriculture. And we ask many uh, stakeholders of Paris to provide roof on the building, for example, and they can, uh, the project leaders can propose how to make urban agriculture in Paris. So this is uh, one way to, to work with the stakeholders in Paris. And also we have uh, funding for developing projects for NDO uh, association. I think you mentioned a very uh, important stakeholder, which is the, the entrepreneurial activity and the innovation that comes from, from those small startups which do not have legacy decisions and assets to, uh, to, to work on. And, and Ian, you, in, in Scotland, um, you work as well with a lot of the SMEs make up such a big part of the, of the economy, right? What's their role? What, yeah. How do you see the potential there? Yeah, and that's, uh, it's just that term, stakeholder, it's an awful term, isn't it? Oh, right. you know, okay, you no, no, it's not, yeah, it's, we all use it. It's a kind of like, I, I never really thought, don't see myself as a stakeholder, but, you know, uh, the, you know, my local government might see me as a stakeholder. Anyway, it's an odd thing. Uh, so getting everybody to round the table, I mean, in some ways, I always think it has been easier than you would imagine because all this idea of the circular economy, because it is about opportunity. There isn't a defined... Uh, methodology of what we're trying to actually achieve. Uh, you know, it's not a prescriptive thing. You're, you know, usually people like me come out and say, uh, the government's set a target, you have to achieve it, or uh, there's a new regulation coming in, how do I help you? And immediately everybody's on the back foot. Uh, the idea of the circular economy is you, you paint a, a very broad vision picture and with lots of opportunities and people start getting excited by it. So I think that helps bringing stakeholders to the table to have that conversation right from the householder or the consumer through community groups to, to through small businesses and big businesses. And I think entrepreneurs love that because they can see free space to, to the degree to actually explore and, and form new partnerships. So I, I, I think that, you know, if, as long as we ride that wave, so to speak, and not try and contain it into here's the five things we think you could do in Glasgow or Aberdeen or Edinburgh, these are, these are the ideas we have. Uh, so don't do that. So really go in there with a kind of blank piece of paper and and try and let people explore these opportunities. Uh, but SME is absolutely key to all of this, uh, and the entrepreneurs that, I mean, and that is probably one of the challenging things, because a lot of the people we are talking to, the team that I've got, that are talking to in terms of business people, they're not on anybody's radar. They're kind of startup companies or individuals with an idea. You know, so again, you, you go out with your stakeholder list that you're gonna have this forum or that forum, or that sector and you, you go to the usual suspects. But actually a lot of those people are not the people for the reasons you've just said, that they have some baggage with them and, and that might be you know baggage that they don't want to change, but also that they're busy on other things at the moment, other business threats or business uh, constraints. And it's the other people who are not on your list that are possibly the most exciting and, uh, and it's how you engage with them, it's how you create a culture and a place for them to come and you know, get involved in it. Uh, and I think that's, going back to try to labor the point about Glasgow, I think that's where we as, an org as a national organization really handed over that, the reins to the Chamber of Commerce, the business people on the ground who had all of those connections and could create that safe space. That was, that was new to us, uh, you know, but we really kind of decided that that was the way forward because they had all those connections. They knew how startups started in Glasgow. They knew how the relationship between academia and uh, you know the, the businesses on the ground and the relationship with local authorities or the public sector and the you know the, the, the hospitals and you name it they understood all those connections on a, almost on a personal level we didn't you know and I think that's another bit of just facilitating that and providing the space so people can actually interact I think there's a, there's there's an interesting point in that there's a role for big organizations to help these small guys scale, and we see it happening in a circular economy 100 uh, very often where there's small startups, disruptive startups with an, an interesting idea or product or service that come in and then work together with a big corporate to, to scale those things. And, and Cisco does also quite a bit of those, that scaling innovation, uh, right? Uh, exactly. We uh, created a network of innovation centers worldwide. We have several in Europe, from Paris to Berlin to London. And our focus is to connect the dots. So we see 
startups doing innovative technologies that are aligned with our objectives and we basically invite them to work in our innovation centers in a co-creation environment and uh, to build these new solutions, these new uh, solutions that really help uh, cities or many other different customers. Uh, as an example here, for instance, in Barcelona, we uh, recently uh, developed in partnership with different startups a new solution for fog computing, for, for doing uh, computing on the edge, so that we could, uh, from a circular economy perspective, optimize the network that already exists in the city of Barcelona by processing the data on the edge and sending the output to the data center in the central mainframe. So making it sure that we could build new services on top, new monetization strategies, and basically decentralize this network. So this is just a, a simple example, uh, but indeed, we, uh, we work at the worldwide level with these startups. We have an innovation uh, acceleration programs uh, w that are running as well, and we specialize, of course, with different uh, verticals within each geography. Um, Thanks. Um, I have a, a question here, which um, in light of the uh, earlier panel session, I think is for you, Owen, um, as your way of doing business uh, appealed to many, um, doing business with, uh, with only with friends on good projects, or what was it again? I just want to do fantastic projects with my friends. Yeah, well, uh, that's my business so, model. <laughs> the question here is, uh, what is the main message to engage companies uh, in, uh, in the circular economy? Um, so there, there's quite a, the, the background sort of here was a bit sort of there. There are so many messages out there. Um, <laughs> is it is it back to the bear again or? Uh, no, you know I think difference? that I think that for when we start engaging with companies, it's really what's your message. And so for us, many times we get as a developer, we get a, a request for proposal that gets sent to us from a real estate broker, and that broker sits behind a client, let's say like Cisco. Uh, Cisco would have a broker send us a, a request that says that they need 20,000 square meters and they want uh, this, that, and the other inside the building. Our first thing that we do, our first answer to that request is to send it back. It's the first thing we do. And we say it's quite arrogant for me to, build, to attempt to build a building for you without even talking to you, Cisco. So my first question would be then, what does the circular economy mean for your business? And we've been operating in this sphere for a little bit. Um, and we have some ideas, but really those ideas should really be coming from you. And from there, we're going to start creating a vision for your project based on what your business needs and how your business functions, and more importantly, what the employees and the people of Cisco need to improve their business. And that way, we should be looking at projects and buildings as tools for corporate performance or areas where we actually engage in fantastic shopping experiences or really schools are like learning factories where we grow little people's minds. How did we get away from this? And, and in that respect, so I think that the circular economy is exciting on so many different angles and it really is about getting to know the person that you're sitting across from and understanding where they are coming from and understanding what some of their threats are as well. And in that respect, you can, you can best identify solutions because it is collaboration really is the name of the game um, the famous example that I use is how we ended up bringing our construction costs down by 19% was by actually working with our general contractor who has one of the most insane business models that I've ever seen. And this is just not my general contractor, but general contracting in general. It typically is that if you earn 2.5%, you're doing a fantastic job in the heart of the crisis over the last few years, make that a, a percent and a half and you're doing pretty well. If something goes wrong, you're most likely on the hook for anywhere between 14 to 18% in failure costs. So the risk is 18% failure costs and your potential revenues are about 1.5%. So one of the first things we did was in to engage with our, our, our supply chain and really the value chain was to say, what's a good earnings model for you? And of course, they bumped that up a little bit and they said, we need 2.5%. And our reaction was, okay, you get three will guarantee you 3% of the earnings. And now what we've done is created a space for collaboration. And we said, but in return for that, I want open book calculation. And I want to have a real discussion with all of our supply chain to make sure we get the best materials, these cradle to cradle certified materials that are built for the circular economy. And I want the highest quality in there. And the result of maximizing the quality, so we say, this is your budget for a solution, give me the highest quality, not this is the solution we need, give us the cheapest price. 
So we say we maximize the quality in that respect, then the next thing you do is you lower the, the failure costs because the higher quality and the good production, the lower the things go wrong, all things being equal. So that's the, that's the way that we've really engaged in that too. And engaging with collaboration in the supply chain is the only way that we can really make the circular economy work. We can't do this in a vacuum. Yeah. We can't do this on our own. And when people look at our products, at the buildings, the sexy part is when the building's there and you get to go inside and it's really neat. But all the stuff that has to take place up front in talking about permits and zoning plans and that is stuff is where the real magic of these projects take place. And working primarily with people like financers of how do you finance this? Because that's where the real power is unlocked in getting that done, the business case. And then when you organize all of these things and get everybody collaborating together and creating the space where I'm vulnerable enough to say that this is what makes me nervous, then, then we can all collectively share risks and share rewards in a place that makes the project perform in a fantastic place. And that's why I, I want to do that with my friends, because if I get there <laughs> together with somebody that's not really open up for collaboration, I tell them I'm vulnerable, then I, what I've done is open my, I've led with the chin, and that's just being naive. <laughs> but there, there's, a, there's an interesting point in that, right? Because you move more into sort of a, a collaborative approach. It doesn't remove competition from the field, but it does sort of change the, the way that you interact with your suppliers and your, the, the, the people you would make contracts with much more on a sort of a shared vision approach as opposed to a transactional kind of cost-oriented focus and, you, and thereby bringing the people that would be normally all the way at the end of the, the supply chain to the table at, and in the very first go, right? Absolutely, and, you know, and that's also for us, that's the basis, that's the heart and soul of our, of our Delta innovation platform. We are rolling percentages of our revenues back into an innovation platform that we've created at Delta. And our projects, these are project-based focuses, so everything needs to be applied within the projects. And the focus is, is that they improve the performance of the buildings and improve our, our revenue model, our margins. So that creates more earnings, that creates better returns, and those returns of the percentages are then rolled back into R&D. And that's how we create this flywheel to improve our innovation. But we are process people. That is really what we do very, very well as real estate developers. The people from Philips know lighting like I will never know. So the real innovation and solutions is deep in your supply chain. But the way we've always organized everything right now is to keep everybody separate from each other, is to keep them not talking with each other so that we can play this zero-sum game based on power and based on timing, hold everything off to the last moment, in order to create some kind of little buffer and percentage of a half a percent in purchasing. And, in, and what that does is that actually sucks the innovation out of your project. It seeps all of the returns and the collaborative forces, and it makes things extremely ineffective and inefficient in the production process. So by really getting down and sitting together, and we have our financers at the table, we've got our construction guys, the engineers, we have people from pension funds that might even be part of the exit, all around that central conversation, that's how we really understand, okay, you need that, you need that, you need that, I need this, let's get to work. And there's, a, there, there's an interesting uh, part in that, which is we, I mean, uh, we spend our time at the foundation looking at this uh, quite intensely, and I would say even, even we would only have an idea of maybe 10% of it. I think Ellen would actually say that we know less of the circular economy yet, so it's kind of unfolding. So as it unfolds, we kind of need to prototype our way towards, uh, towards a circular economy. And um, uh, another question came in, which, is, which kind of sort of links to that, which is this idea of um, what we see working very well within the programs that we run in the governments and cities program and so forth, is this idea of best practice sharing. And so uh, a question is, so how do we encourage cities to lead by example? And are there some, some uh, uh, best practices that you could say, well, from this kind of prototyping, what could you recommend other cities to do from where you've gotten to uh, so far? As a method to, to gather stakeholders or as a concrete actions? Well, s setting up an, uh, a white paper on a circular economy strategy is, is, is not uh, something small. So is there sort of a best practice that you can share? Say, well, definitely do that, but don't do that. I don't know. I think maybe it's different for, from each city b right. b cities because we saw cities, they start with, uh, for example, one material or one, one issue for, uh, with food or with, uh, I don't know, with beer. <laughs> but I don't know what is the best. Maybe each city must develop on its own way. I, I think collab 
collaboration is really a uh, nice way to, to think and to make things. Because as you said before, if you gather people, you think together, you open your mind. And that's what we saw in the trade mission. I think it was very, really nice to be in Amsterdam. It, I think it was in March. So I don't know how many people from 23 countries, or I don't know how many countries were represented on this mm. trade mission, but we shared moments, we share experience, and I think this collaboration is really important. So for cities, maybe it's the most important to be open mind to see, okay, what is important for our city, what is our vision, how we want to lead it, and to, and to permit. Uh, all the business, the NGO of, of the city to, to have a, a place and a chance to express the, um, the project they want to lead for the country. I think this is really important. Thanks, uh, thanks for sharing that. You want to you wanna add to that? You know, I think th th there's something really that came up in our earlier session that came on from the designer, Chris, that mm -hmm. was talking about culture. I think that's really fantastic, right? So starting with things of culture, what are, what are some cultural heritage points from your community and starting in there, like how to couture or something? Well, we, we talked with, uh, with France and with Paris about some developments and our idea was, how do we showcase the joie de vivre in, in real estate? How do we bring that into communities and, and render that visible? So these types of things that are quintessentially French or quintessentially Italian, quintessentially Portuguese and Scottish, those are the things to really start and celebrate your, your cultural heritage and celebrate your own diversity. And then you build this enthusiasm around there. We're Dutch, so it's probably beer. <laughs> Seems to be a bit of a recurring theme here, uh, which uh, now we still have some time left, on, but after that, I'm sure there'll be drinks. Um, so uh, coming, coming back, the, the other part of this question was around procurement, uh, which is uh, something that uh, you, you put a stake in the ground for, uh, Ian. So something you could say, well, how, how could we, what we, could we do in circular procurement? And uh, maybe just also, uh, because we often hear from, from businesses saying, well, yeah, if, if just governments would procure in a, in a, in a circular way, then, ev then the world will change, which is maybe just a bit too easy, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> I could, uh, absolutely. And I think I call it sleeping beauty uh, of the circular <laughs> economy. Uh, I think... Yeah, the example, the, the one example we have obviously in Scotland is just, you know, we have a company who are doing something similar that Philips are doing, like uh, leasing light. Uh, and we've been working with others on the same sort of model about, you know, performance, selling performance. So these are SMEs, quite, quite substantial SMEs, uh, but they're really interested in this. So they're, they're interested in the public procurement contract. So we're helping them to develop you know, the tender or trying to access that, that'd be a really great opportunity for the public sector. Uh, and, you know, I'm not naming names, but, you know, whether it was a hospital or otherwise, it doesn't matter. So this is all going very well until a point somebody says, well, hold on a minute, uh, I was going to buy this stuff out of my capital budget. If I go down this route, it becomes revenue. And they physically didn't, the guy in the procurement in the public sector just didn't know how to do that. It was that fundamental. It was almost like a button on the computer. He just couldn't, or a spreadsheet. He just couldn't, he couldn't press a button. You know, he just didn't know how to do it. You know, and, and of course, that's one of the challenges. So it's not as easy as just saying, oh, we should just buy performance and stuff like that. I think genuinely, people are beginning to understand that in the in the public procurement space. And we do a lot of work with public procurement uh, professionals in terms of training, uh, not just in, not just in the circular economy, but wider sustainability issues. Uh, and that's very positive, but that, that is one of the challenges because a lot of public sector agencies in Scotland have access to capital receipts. They, they have, they can, they can use capital quite easily, you know, relatively easily, even in the, in the, in the current constraints. But revenue budgets, my God, they're a killer. So if you're trying to shift sort of a leasing model on them, you know, if you're trying to put that onto them, you know, immediately that's a barrier, you know, regardless of the business case, because simply they're saying, I've got to reduce my le revenue budget by 10% and you want to add to it. So that's just an example of a complete blockage in the system that needs to be unpacked. And that's not because people are saying, I don't want to do this. That's just, that's just the, the system. Mm -hmm. It's another change of the system. As we talk about, the whole system needs to change. We need to think differently about how we actually set our public finance up, uh, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not really about attacking the circular economy. So I think it's still, it's still a big issue, uh, or certainly a big opportunity, because you're right, if, if, it would, if we got it right, it would unlock a market. I think, you know, bu new businesses 
uh, would either, you know, Scotland, Scotland cracked it first, uh, you know, lots of businesses are going to locate to Scotland because the circular business is going to locate to Scotland because they're going to think, look, we can now access public uh, procurement and it'd be good for homegrown circular economy market as well and that would hold, that would pull new businesses through and then that would like spin into the private sector. So I think that's, that is an opportunity and, and we're very keen but it comes back to collaboration. So uh, because we're all part of the EU procurement uh, framework, uh, you know, it's, it's important that we can share. We, we're all probably looking at the same things across Europe around how can we shape or uh, look at public procurement uh, rules and regulations to, to incentivize circular business models. So again, I come back to collaboration. This is not something I think we'll crack on our own in Scotland. I think having that network of, uh, of not just cities, but other pu public procurement agencies at national and, and local level uh, would be really good. Maybe pilot things as well. Uh, I remember another, sorry, I'm uh, hogging the mic slightly, but in a previous role I had, uh, I was, around when public procurement agencies, particularly in Scotland, introduced social clauses. It was a thing that nobody had heard of before. How did you do that? How do you start to uh, let procurement contracts with social clauses and uh, the, around uh, social inclusion opportunities, apprenticeships, training, all that sort of stuff? That's now mainstream in Scotland in terms of public procurement. So it can be done. So I guess it's that type of what lessons did we learn and how can we bring that through? Uh, but I do think there is a role for big companies and their procurement to show not just what they're doing, they're, they're thinking about being circular themselves, but maybe they need to start thinking about who their suppliers and how they can work with them and actually think, well, we're not actually going to buy your stuff next year. We're actually going to buy a performance. And if some of the bigger companies can start to take that on as well, uh, or certainly talk to their suppliers about the opportunities, I think that, that comes back to what Owen's been talking about as well. I think that's an actually a, a really important point. So because if you if you talk to uh, most of the, the bigger companies and they would ask you, so well, where do I start, right? Where do I start? And then, then typically the answer is sort of on, on twofold. One, it's uh, the product or the service that you provide and how can, it, how can you enable something? So how can you sell mobility instead of a product? But the other one is a big one, which is how do you run your own operations? Uh, so how do you run your server parks and your, and your, your data centers? Um, so we're, we're almost coming towards the answer. If there's a burning question, do send it through uh, to the uh, app uh, or ask it uh, at the mic. I have one uh, question which kind of brings us back to the IoT piece. So we think that uh, we certainly see that, that information uh, technology and the Internet of Things is allowing us to loop products and materials at the highest value and utility. Uh, but a very valid question is, um, how do we ensure that these products and materials that are, we are looping it, are actually restorative and regenerative by design, so that we're not lo uh, perfectly looping something bad? Uh, I don't know who wants to uh, take this, uh, this, this question. Who has an idea on that? Well, um, Cisco tries to get certification in place for, you know, from batteries to all the components that we, we uh, procure. Uh, we work closely with our suppliers to make sure that they are strict in terms of regulation so that from a circular economy perspective, we, we get uh, products that on one side have quality, but on the other side, they, they follow international standards, okay? Uh, and then, of course, we, we also have, from a life cycle perspective, we also uh, do our best to capture the equipment that's on the market and recycle it uh, to the best of our capabilities to make sure that the, uh, the equipment has a, a proper end. Uh, from an IoT standpoint, I think that by using tools, and Owen here mentioned uh, Watson, uh, if we use artificial intelligence or other machine learning uh, capabilities, engines, that can help us define those models, I think that will be very interesting. As a rapid example, Google published uh, one or two weeks ago um, a study they did, they, they created three uh, independent uh, AI engines, and uh, the rules were basic. One had to send a message to the other, and the third had to intercept the message, so break it. So from nothing, from these two functions I just described, the artificial intelligence engines created a crypto cryptography uh, design to prevent the third one from capturing the message from scratch. And even the Google engineers didn't know how they did that, okay? So 
from as scary as it might seem, yeah, that's um, <laughs> applied to cir the circular economy, it can prove very interesting. It could, it could solve some of the challenge we don't, uh, we don't even dare to, uh, to tackle right now. Uh, buildings have been, sort of, what's the leasing period that you'd say typically is looked at after, for buildings? For buildings? Now, we're looking right now, and, and we're, we're engaging in about 10-year leases. We've done some for 15, we've done some for 20. Um, we're looking at use periods of these buildings for now about 50 to 60 years. I think that that's a pretty much more realistic time frame. And in, in all reality, actually, we're already seeing buildings in the 90s in The Hague and other fantastic A1 locations being irrelevant now. So, you know, how, how long these assets are actually in play is becoming much, much shorter and shorter. So, if, so if, how do you ensure that they are full of healthy materials? Well, you know, I think that that's, that's an interesting thing. And, and the real question, this is, I think, the heart of really the discussion that a lot of us should be having with each other when we're engaging in, in collaborative businesses, is what is the real value set that is going into making our decisions? And I don't mean value set from where's my value. I mean, what are my values as a society? And I think you could create the most elegant business model or the most elegant algorithm and I was always taught that garbage in is garbage out, gigo. So if we're not putting the right thing in, then expect the wrong thing to come out at the other end. And our value set, our intentions need to really be driving this. So this is really about the decisions that we make are what do we want to achieve and what is the right thing to do, not always the easiest thing to do or the thing that we're doing right now. So in that respect, I think um, a, a good example is we had a, a company come to us and they wanted to create this circular economy measurer. How, circu how circular are you? And that seems to be a pervasive question that a lot of people are trying to answer these days. And we started saying, okay, so you're going to measure all of how circular our buildings are and all of that. What is your criteria on what you're measuring? And they said, virgin material. How do I eliminate virgin material out of this? And we said, okay. So if I put together toxic soft PVC and, and take it from out of an old building and put it together in a third world, ship it to a third world country and put it together with child labor, ship it all the way back to Holland and put it back in my building, that's circular. And they were like, oh, well, maybe you got a point there. So it's much more about than just removing materials. It's about the, the type of actions that we're doing. And this is why I think that Cradle to Cradle is a fantastic design paradigm for the circular economy because we're talking about being positive in our social in our social activities. We're being positive in our environmental activities and we're being positive in our economic activities. And so for us, this is really the design paradigm that enables our buildings to be well positioned for this growing and, and very real circular economy. It's having this uh, shared uh, vision of a restorative and regenerative system on the horizon and, um, uh, and, and working our way towards that. Um, so maybe just on the, on the final part of, uh, of the panel, um, as we've come to end of the first day of the Smart Cities Conference, uh, we've heard uh, many interesting things and I've wrote, written down a, a couple of them already. Uh, but maybe just from each, each one of you, what was the, 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 your main learning as, as well, experts in the circular economy, at least deeply involved in it already? What was, what, what was your takeaway from, from today? Something new that you learned? Oh, something new, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> something about we all like beer. Uh, well, actually, I get it. I mean, on, uh, Owen's here, flatter him. I, I just, I, I think there was a slide, a couple of slides you put up, uh, talked about the, the value of the copper that's in your building, or the, you know, the, the potential value of the copper that's in your building when you put it in. Is now, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's about eight or ten times more now because the price of copper has gone up and you said the same for steel and the same. I just, if you start to th actually get people to think that, you know, you put all that metal or resources into your building and actually it's going up in value. I don't know it's not easy to that, but if you actually design it so you could get that stuff out, then that's, that is an investment. And I think that's just, that, that slide was just fantastic. Certain enterprise companies like DHL shared today that uh, when they detected issues like how can I build a, a vehicle to improve my uh, delivery system, uh, they found that no one could produce the car for them. So they took on their bold task of building the car themselves. So sometimes it's not 
others that we need to outsource the equipment, but because we are the experts and we live on the day-to-day -day basis the issues and the problems, we need to fix it. So from, from a circular economy perspective, they looked at the business model and they said, how can we solve our own problem? So they built the car fleet uh, uh, as an example uh, to improve their system. Uh, I think that's a very good uh, point. And uh, the beer and the bread, yes. <laughs> I, I just want to rehash and reiterate that for me, the main takeaway that I've really been seeing, and Casper, we've known each other for years now, and we've been three years in the CE100, and we've really been uh, very ta talking a lot. I see a lot, a lot of other CE100 and other circular economy experts here as well. And for a long time, we've been talking about the physical things, the bricks and the mortar, or the fast-moving consumer goods, the packaging, and that now that this discussion is evolving into a world that includes the people, lo and behold, that for me is very, very exciting because that was really where we should be doing, setting it up. We should be, that's really where we see a lot of the value being driven in, in not, in looking at the interactions between our activities and actions and circular economic models and their influences on the people and vice versa. That's something that I'm very excited to see taking place. Well, today I learned that even in bigger cities, we must uh, work with interconnected villages. <laughs> So I think it was a very good word that we heard this morning. And uh, I heard also about confidence. And I keep the, the, those three words in my mind. Yeah, yeah that, I think that's, uh, that, that quite nicely sums up um, some of the really important things about the circular economy being a, an economic driver. Um, and it, it is about prototyping. Let's not wait for stuff to happen. It's about, uh, from a design thinking perspective, building in empathy. So knowing where you're designing for. Uh, and uh, we start small and we scale it. And we, we, we piece together the parts. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the panel for, uh, for some excellent reflections.